Okay, the next topic in interference that we're also going to address in the lab this week is thin film interference. And the reason why we, we want to look at this is because it has a strong effect on things like Fresnel reflection. And so let's do a simple thought experiment here. Let's say I have light incident on these materials here. Let's assume that we add a thin film on the front here. And as a result, I get a Fresnel reflection when the light goes from air to this material. So there's my first one. And then also, right here, as it goes on the interface between this added material and the substrate material here. And so I get two Fresnel reflections off each of these interfaces because the refractive index of air, the refractive index of this coating, and the refractive index of the substrate are all different. And we know that using the Fresnel reflection equation, when the refractive indices are different, we get some reflection. Now, let's also assume that the refractive indis, indis, index differences between each of these is the same, such, as the ref, such that the first reflection, R1, is equal to the second reflection, R2. So you just need the refractive index differences between each of these layers to be the same. Okay. Now, one thing I want you to note right off the bat is this will already change the amount of reflection compared to going just from air to a substrate. The reason why is, here's a simple um, way to think of that, is that Fresnel reflection is caused by a square of refractive index difference. So let's say our total refractive index difference between two materials is 4, right? And so let's say I get then, I get 4 squared equals 16 for the total reflection, okay? What if I broke that up into, into two layers, so it dropped by 2 each time? Well, then I would have 2 squared plus 2 squared, which is equal to 8. I would have half the reflection. And so one thing to notice right off the bat is that if I do nothing special here, I will have already cut the refraction, I mean the amount of Fresnel reflection down, because I have smaller steps in refractive index, and the Fresnel reflection is the square of the steps in refractive index. And so you can, you can reduce reflectivity from a surface this way. But this case is special. We're going to assume the incident angle and thickness of the layer creates a film that is, has, is a quarter wavelength thick. So we call it a quarter wavelength coating. Okay? Meaning that the thickness of it is lambda over 4 over the refractive index, okay, because refractive index reduces the wavelength, and then also taking consideration the incidence angle here. And so if you're off angle, you'll need to basically figure out what the path length is in here. And so what's going to happen then is look at the phase difference between R1 and R2. So if R1 is, is, is phase 0, okay, look at the second R. It goes a quarter wavelength in, it's for now reflected, quarter wavelength out, and by the time it's gone a quarter wavelength and a quarter wavelength, that's a half wavelength, meaning by the time it gets here, it's a half wavelength behind R1, meaning that it is 180 degrees out of phase. Therefore, I have destructive interference. And so what happens is, remember, by interference principles, you don't destroy the light. It just tells it it has to go somewhere else. And so it tells it it has to transmit. Again, you get perfect transmission for this case because the reflected portions are interfering destructively. Again, interference commands the light where it must go. So, there are some practical limitations. Think of a visible white light. What limits do you have on this approach? Well, this is for a single wavelength, right? For a single wavelength. White light is made of all sorts of wavelengths, and so a stand, single quarter wavelength coating would not work for all wavelengths because they would reflect at different different phases of their own wavelength, right? And so it would be good for maybe, you know, you could design it for a portion of the visible spectrum, but it wouldn't work all that great for the entire visible spectrum because it's dependent on wavelength. What about angle of incidence? The other limitation here is, of course, this will have a strong effect of angle of incidence. If I go straight on, my path length short. If I go at a really shallow angle, my path length's longer, and that'll change the amount of time I spend in this material, which will change the phase delay between the first reflection and the second reflection. And so there's a strong angular dependence on this as well. This is, you'll see this come up at the end of this uh, mini lecture when we, at the uh, review questions at the end. So there's your hint for you. Now, for practical applications, you typically, if you have a substrate that's 1.5 for refractive index, this
coating, you would typically be want to be 1.28 if you do the math. But very few materials have this low refractive index. Practically, you often just use a nice hard coating of magnesium fluoride, which has a non-ideal refractive index of 1.38. It's not 1.28, but it still reduces 4% for now reflection off a glass surface to less than 1% typically. So that's a big advantage. What kind of applications might you use this for? Well, imagine a camera lens where you want to get as much light in and not have light bouncing off the lenses to interfere with your images. Another example is anti-reflection coating on glasses to reduce glare as well. And so you can get some very simple applications where you use anti-reflection coatings. There's also other single layer examples which are important in optics as well. So any thin film can achieve thin film interference. You can see the soap bubble here we'll talk about it at the end. The system can also have a single layer that is the lower refractive index. So if I have glass, glass, and an air gap in between, you can see the air gaps wider here, shorter here, and as a result I would see fringes between these two materials. This exact approach is used to test how flat glass and optics are. And so there's something you can buy called an optical flat, which you'll put against another piece of glass to test the smoothness or the radius of curvature. Here's an example here. This is the flat side of a plano convex lens. So here's the convex side, there's the plano side, being put on an optical flat surface. And you can see all these fringes telling you that the air gap height is varying. Where's the gap the smallest? Well, you can tell it's right here. See where it comes down? That's the point of contact there and where the fringes are the closest. Why do the colors cycle between blue, green, red, blue, green, red? So it goes blue, green, red, blue, green, red as you go. Well, that's because the gap is continuously cycling such that the interference is cycling through, is the peak interference is cycling through different uh, wavelengths of the visible spectrum. And so the key thing is when you have a gap and you're doing interference, it'll work for any integer number of lambda, okay? And so if you make the gap, you know, um, let's say you made the gap uh, 0.25 lambda, then it'll show up for 0.5 lambda, okay? It will show up for 1 lambda, 2 lambda, etc., where you'll still see the same interference pattern, okay? And so that's why you'll see these things cycle up through the different colors. Here's the curved side of a plano convex lens. The curved side being placed down on an optical flat. You can see that's where it touches the surface, and then you get these fringes. How could you use this to measure the curvature of that? Well, optically, you could do that because you know if you're using, if you know the wavelength of light, you know the height difference as you get to each fringe. Then you can measure the distance out and then plot the curvature of the lens versus distance. So if I started to plot curvature here, it would be the lens would be going up, where here's it's in contact, and here it's the furthest away from the lens, from the from the from the surface. Now, you can also make this much more powerful and sophisticated using multiple layers. And I'm going to have you simulate this for your homework this week. So, let's look at a more complicated case here with multiple layers. And we're going to look at interference and see exactly what it could do for us. And so we have multiple layers of silicon dioxide, titanium dioxide, silicon dioxide, titanium, etc. Okay? And each of these are designed to be a quarter wavelength thick, meaning that it's the wavelength of light in vacuum divided by 4 divided by the refractive index. Remember, the refractive index shortens the wavelength of light. So if I want to make this a quarter wavelength of light, the thickness has to be calculated as follows. And I make it a quarter wavelength for the silicon dioxide as well. Notice the silicon dioxide is thicker than titanium dioxide. That's because its refractive index is lower. This higher refractive index reduces this number, so it has to be thinner to be a quarter wavelength thickness. Okay? So, let's introduce light. Here comes my light. And I'm going to use a convention. Instead of using degrees, I'm going to measure things in terms of 0, pi, pi over 2, things like that, where 2 pi is, uh, of course, 360 degrees, and pi is 180 degrees. So if light comes to this first interface and is reflected, then at this point it's gone no phase shift. So I'll say that's a phase shift of zero. So it's in, it's, this is still in phase here. Let's go to the next interface here. By the time it makes it across this quarter wavelength film, it would have shifted pi over two. Pi over two is quarter of a wavelength, right? So pi over two, then it's reflected pi over two. So the total is pi, pi over two and pi, 
But if you remember from EM fields, when you Fresnel reflect off a material that has a high index to a low index, you get an extra pi phase shift as the, as the uh, photon flips. So the total is pi over 2, pi over 2, plus pi, 2 pi. Notice that the reflections are in phase. That's a hint. Let's go deeper here. Pi over 2, pi over 2 for the phase shift. Down here, I'll, I'll show the reflection. Pi over 2, pi over 2. 4 pi's over 2 gives me a total of 2 pi. The reflection is also in phase. Because this is low index to high index, there's no extra pi phase shift. Let's go deeper here. Pi over 2, 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 pi over 2. That gives me 6 times pi over 2, which is 3 pi. But I also get an extra phase shift here because I'm going from high index to low index. So 3 pi plus pi gives me 4 pi. All the reflections are in phase. So for this system, this becomes a perfect reflector. You can get up to what you can measure up to 100% reflectivity from a system like this. And so, there's numerous types of names for this type of reflector. They call it a dielectric mirror, Bragg reflector, 1D photonic crystal. They call it a photonic crystal because it's periodic, right? Crystals are periodic, and this is periodic in one dimension. What would happen if we switch this from not quarter wavelength to half wavelength? Well, if you do that, you'll find, for example, for this first case, you would have, um, for the first case here, you would have pi, because it's no longer pi over 2, it's pi. Pi, 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 you get 3 pi, and so it would be 0 and 3 pi, that's 180 degrees out of phase. If you do all the calculations, you would find these are all out of phase. This thing would become a perfect transmitter. It would look like a perfect piece of glass. Even if you had all these different layers in it, it would look like a piece of glass. So it's interesting that if you just change the wavelength or the thickness of these layers, you could have something that looks like a perfect reflector, or an absolutely perfect transmitter. Now in a simple design where all the layers are the same thickness then you can calculate the angular dependence for the maximum reflection as follows. And notice again it's an integer number of wavelengths because you're, that's the you know if, if you interfere at 180 degrees interfering at um, you know uh, 90 degrees or 180 degrees plus 360 degrees is the exact same thing, right? So if you're 0 degrees, 360, on, on and on and on, integer number of wavelengths are the same thing. So you can use this calculation to take into the incidence angle to this type of system. This week in lab, you have a, a small part of the project is to look at this Vacuity Enhanced Specular Reflector, ESR Reflector, which is made of 300 layers of alternating refractive index polymer. It has no metal layers in it at all, and when you look at this thing in lab, it's going to look like a perfect mirror. In fact, if you measure the reflectivity versus wavelength, you can see it's way up here above 99% above for most of the visible spectrum. That's much better than aluminum, which is 90%, protected aluminum, which is 87%, and protected silver. This should be here, by the way, this text got moved, which should be about 95%. So no metal required, and it's better than the best metal reflectors. And this is a product made by 3M. Here's the paper that described how they did it. It's really clever if you ever want to look this up and, 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 and learn more about it. I discovered this product for myself the first time when I needed a really good UV reflector because metals are poor UV reflectors. So I, f I heard about this product. I'm like, well, I'm going to try this for ultraviolet, and it failed miserably. Why is that? Well, look what happens when you go to UV wavelengths. The reflectivity falls off because this is dependent, uh, designed based on interference, and if you shift wavelength, interference can go from a perfect reflector to a perfect transmitter. So you can see how fast the reflection falls off and this thing starts to become a perfect transmitter. You can also go beyond one-dimensional periodicity to 2D or 3D. And these type of what they call photonic crystals have really powerful applications and impact. So people talk all the time about optical computer chips, but one of the challenges, how are you going to make wires that can can route light around really tight corners. And as when we talk about optical fibers, you'll find that you, can, you have a limited and bend radius to keep the light confined. Well, what they have here is air gaps in silicon. All these little holes are air gaps. And here's regular silicon. And they're using infrared light, which is not absorbed by silicon. And what happens is the light goes through here 
And because of the interference, it's perfectly confined and forced by interference to go turn sharp corners that you can never do with an optical fiber. When we talk about optical fibers, you also see that they surround the, the core of an optical fiber sometimes with an interference pattern that keeps the light confined in the center using interference principles. And you can even go three-dimensional. This is a bunch of basically little silica microspheres, glass microspheres, or nanospheres, surrounded by air, very periodic, which gives you, at the end, the same structure you have in opal, which gives you all these strange colors when you take an opal and shine it around and move, it, move, its, uh, move its angle of incidence with light around. So that's why you see all these strange colors you get from opal, because you get optical interference. If you're looking uh, for, more, for more information, Chapter 7 in Fun Fundamentals of Photonics provides numerous MATLAB techniques for analyzing photonic crystals, if you're interested. So at that point, we'll do a quick review and take a break, and then we're almost done with this, this lecture.